Hello, everyone. I'm David Napier, chair of today's Vaccines in View. Uh, welcome back to those of you who joined us last week for a great talk by Andy Lakoff. And those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome also. Uh, as of yesterday, the WHO reported in its weekly update that in addition to the currently available COVID-19 vaccinations, there are now some 280 vaccines in development across the globe. 96 in clinical development, and 184 in preclinical. One might rightly ask, why are so many being developed? Is it scientific curiosity, lack of global cooperation, vaccine nationalism, business competitiveness, or a failure in global health governance? Well, I think you'll agree with me that it takes only a moment to realize that it's a combination of all of these things with significant cold chain requirements for many vaccines and the awareness that some places may not even see a vaccine for months or possibly even years, the need to develop vaccines that are safe and easily distributed drives what looks like, if you just review these numbers at least, some major redundancy in responses worldwide that are not only scientifically, but possibly also politically driven. Today's speaker, Frederick Keck, is senior researcher at CNRS, that's France's National Center for Scientific Research. He's also director of the Laboratory for Social Anthropology in Paris, co-editor of Rutledge's The Anthropology of Epidemics, and author of several books, including his highly acclaimed Avian Reservoirs, which focuses on virus hunters and so-called sentinel posts in China. Now, I won't describe in advance what Frederick means by sentinel posts, as I'm sure he will have a good bit to say about this, in fact, uh, if not in the talk itself in the discussion. But I will say that Avian Reservoirs, the project uh, itself, took Frederick the better part of a decade to carry out, during which time he studied the zoonotic transmission of epidemic diseases from animals to humans. That is how we develop and store vaccines, experimentally simulate viral mutations, and identify sentinel systems to track disease emergence. Then along came COVID-19, just as Frederick Savian book was published, leaving him expertly positioned to comment on the cryopolitics, that is the cold life politics of COVID-19. For those of you who already know Frederick's work, I need not say here that he's well versed both in the history of philosophy and anthropology and always a real pleasure to listen to. So Frederick, welcome to our seminar series. Uh, his talk is entitled Stockpiling Vaccines, storing viruses, the cryopolitics of SARS-CoV-2. Now, on a housekeeping note, uh, just before we begin, is we've got a large, a large number of people on this call and attending the series. Um, all questions that you may have should be sent via the Q&A button, and you can follow the questions in advance and vote on them to push them up to the top of the list. Frederick will speak for about 30 minutes after we'll, which, uh, we'll open up the uh, Q&A. So, Frederick, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much, David, for your invitation. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to talk about uh, after uh, Andrew Lakoff, um, who uh, talked to, uh, to you um, last week about uh, preparedness, uh, because my talk will follow up uh, very nicely on what uh, uh, Andy uh, uh, said. Um, so um, I think Andrew Lakoff talked to you about stockpiling as a technique of preparedness and the rationality of, of prioritizing uh, publics uh, in cases of uh, uh, pandemics uh, to detect the uh, vulnerabilities in the infrastructure. What I would like to show in this talk is more the uh, material culture of conservation uh, of uh, um, vaccines uh, and uh, remembering that uh, vaccines are viruses that are attenuated and that uh, are produced um, in a certain form um, and looking at the, the, the differences in temperature between viruses and vaccines, which is what I call the cryopolitics and the different um, uh, techniques of, of government uh, that they involve. So um, uh, first I would like to uh, recall uh, three um, current events uh, in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the first is the WHO report published in uh, February 2020, uh, showing that uh, China uh, was uh, the first uh, country hit by the pandemic, but also a kind of model in the management of this uh, pandemic by the strong measures 
of lockdown that were applied in Wuhan in uh, the city where the pandemic emerged. And the, 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 the report, uh, which was mostly written by Chinese experts, showed that the world was not ready uh, for the, the strong measures that had been applied in, in China, measures of tracing um, uh, and, and building hospitals. Um, and this is the current debate on the uh, zero COVID uh, strategy, which has uh, proved so uh, uh, beneficial for, for China, uh, which, is, which can be called a way of freezing the country uh, so that the, the economy can start again. Um, after uh, 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 an inflammation uh, of uh, uh, the emerging uh, virus, as we can see on this curve, and the report uh, uh, says that the, the, the figures are, are real, the, the, the epidemic uh, uh, finds a, a quick uh, surge and then uh, comes down. So one year later, another uh, report from the WHO after a, a mission of uh, Chinese and, and foreign experts in Wuhan uh, investigates the origins of the COVID-19. And there are uh, four scenarios for the emergence of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, these different scenarios have different uh, probability, but I, I, I was interested to see how the, the question of freezing and temperature was involved in these different scenarios. Uh, so one of the scenarios is the direct transmission from bats to humans, uh, as there was a case in the Mojang Cave in 2013 that, that showed the, this potential uh, transmission. Uh, the other is the transmission on a wet market by an intermediary animal, uh, which was supposed to be a snake at the beginning, then a pangolin. Today, uh, hypothesis uh, investigations turn to, to minks, um, and, but, but all the samples that have been made uh, have not uh, tested positive. Um, uh, around the market for, for, uh, for South Cove 2. Uh, the third scenario is an import from abroad by frozen products, um, markets in Qingdao um, and uh, uh, Shandong uh, have been, uh, and also in Beijing have been um, uh, tested positive for South Cove 2. And so China started um, uh, testing all kinds of frozen products uh, uh, to show that it may have, that SARS-CoV-2 may have emerged from from, from uh, abroad and then arrived in, in China. And the fourth uh, hypothesis is a, is a laboratory accident. If the uh, viruses that have been collected in in caves um, were uh, um, and, and and stored in freezers uh, uh, could uh, escape from uh, the the laboratory, this famous P4 laboratory, the Institute of Virology of of Wuhan. Um, uh, which has been uh, built with, with high biosecurity standards. So all the debate turns around the conditions of storing, freezing and displaying um, these, these viruses in, in laboratories and in, in markets under high biosecurity uh, conditions. And then the third actuality, um, of course, uh, concerns uh, vaccines uh, with the global race on vaccines. And here again, China, plays a, a major role um, with uh, Sinovac, which is a state company based in Beijing, uh, producing um, a, a vaccine, Coronavac, uh, that doesn't rely on RNA as other uh, vaccines, but on uh, inactivated strains of SARS-CoV-2. But this kind of uh, technical, um, uh, um, technical weakness is turned into an asset uh, by China in um, the uh, display, in the sharing of, of viruses, of vaccines, because uh, this vaccine is conserved between two and eight degrees, uh, while RNA vaccine, uh, such as Moderna, are conserved at uh, uh, minus 20, 20 degrees, and Pfizer is conserved as at minus 70 degrees. Now, the innovations in uh, vaccines may lead these um, pharmaceutical companies to uh, um, um, increase the, the temperature of conservation, um, but still it, it's, it's, a, it's a weakness of these uh, uh, technical innovations uh, that they are difficult to uh, uh, conserve uh, and, 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 and bring uh, to uh, hospitals and, and patients. Uh, so China used this argument of the temperature uh, of the uh, vaccines to share uh, the vaccines with um, its vaccine with uh, um, a lower income country, 
uh, and it has China has developed its own politics uh, of um, um, uh, pharmaceutical testing uh, with uh, Indonesia um, uh, being a major site of clinical research uh, and receiving uh, 1.2 million doses of uh, CoronaVac in, in January. Also Brazil being very involved um, um, at the Institute Potentan in, in Sao Paulo uh, with some controversies on the efficacy of the vaccines in the first uh, trials. Uh, and that led the Chinese uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi in February 2021 uh, to accuse um, uh, developed nations, um, such as uh, US or Europe, of stockpiling large quantities of COVID-19 uh, and leading to inadequate supply for poor countries. Um, uh, by contrast, uh, China provides vaccines to 53 countries and gives 10 million doses to the WHO uh, COVAX uh, facility. As we know speak, uh, about 10% of the Chinese population uh, has been uh, vaccinated um, with um, Chinese uh, vaccines, and there is still a, a lot of uh, diplomacy uh, between China and, and Europe and the US uh, to accept visitors uh, from abroad if they don't have the, the Chinese vaccine. So the, the vaccine has become um, a, a tool of, of diplomacy uh, for China uh, to revert the, the, the accusation uh, of being uh, the, the origin of the, of the pandemic, uh, also by using its, um, its, its low-tech uh, facility uh, as a, a way to provide vaccines uh, to, um, uh, to, to what was called before third world countries. Um, and, and so, and so the, 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 the technical facilities of, of China uh, have become an argument for a new uh, position uh, on, on the global game. So these this three um, uh, events in, our, uh, in the current state of the, of the pandemic uh, may be um, uh, traced to uh, what uh, Andy Lakoff has called uh, techniques of preparedness um, as a technique to uh, anticipate the future uh, and imagine uh, disasters um, to mitigate their uh, consequences uh, by contrast with classical forms of prevention where um, diseases are calculated in terms of risk on, on, a, on a population. Um, so the, the, the emergence of the COVID-19 uh, and, and, um, uh, and, and is, could, could not be predicted. There were no vaccines for uh, coronaviruses before um, um, COVID-19. Even the SARS crisis was not uh, uh, severe enough uh, to um, uh, lead to the production of, of vaccines. Um, so, so new techniques uh, had to be invented uh, to, to, to manage this, this pandemic. And even if this uh, pandemic had been um, anticipated, um, the, the techniques of preparedness for this pandemic uh, were uh, in some way uh, revisioned and, and refined. So the simulation or worst case scenarios is really corresponds to what I described first with the uh, capacity of, of China to control rapidly uh, the epidemic uh, because the uh, hospital staff were, were prepared, um, they had done exercise. Um, the second debate on the origins of uh, SARS-CoV-2 can be related to uh, the uh, construction of sentinels, that is uh, um, uh, early warning signals that are sent uh, by uh, uh, animals um, uh, to uh, see uh, if they cause a zoonotic outbreak. Uh, to follow the mutations of viruses uh, as they cross uh, species border. Um, and this is a picture of Shou Zhen Li, the virologist, uh, the head of the Institute of Virology in, in Wuhan, who has collected these uh, viruses from uh, these strains from uh, uh, bats uh, in, in South China. And, and the debate on vaccines is what uh, uh, Andy Lake of calls stockpiling. Um, so th that's what I call the three S simulation, sentinels and stockpiling. And stockpiling is uh, all the um, priority goods uh, to mitigate the effect of pandemics, uh, such as vaccines, uh, treatments, or, or masks. Um, so th the, the question I've, I've raised in my work uh, was how these different techniques of uh, preparedness um, were um, managed in terms of the uh, material culture of, of producing vaccine and conserving them, 
uh, and and also uh, how they um, uh, allow to trace continuities between humans and and non-humans. And I rely on the concept of cryopolitics, um, which was um, uh, borrowed by Joanna Radin and Emma Koval uh, to debates about uh, uh, climate change and in the Arctic and to describe. Um, um, uh, techniques of freezing, opening new possibilities of knowledge, such as uh, arc uh, freezing species or cryogeny uh, freezing uh, bodies, uh, and that produce what Joanna Radin called latent life. So uh, a, a life whose death is, is deferred uh, and uh, which create new relations uh, um, uh, between living beings. And uh, Joanna Radin also talked about plan insight uh, in the sense that uh, the the present is imagined as a future past uh, and must be rationalized uh, to, uh, um, uh, to, to anticipate the consequences uh, uh, in the future, um, uh, as, for example, uh, threatened species are organized to, to uh, live longer. Um, and I, I borrow uh, from this debate on cryopolitics the idea that differences in temperature of conservation uh, involve differences in social relation and, and new possibilities of, of knowledge and of, of government uh, of living being. Uh, and so that's why that's how I um, related uh, Andy Lakoff's uh, techniques of, of preparedness uh, to the question of um, uh, relations between humans and, and non-humans. Um, and, and for each of uh, the uh, techniques um, that are applied today uh, to anticipate the future, I, I, I found a, a pastoral technique that, that I relate to um, uh, um, societies where humans are above uh, animals, and, 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 and on the other side, uh, synergetic techniques where humans are on the same level as animals and shared with them uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, so on the level of sentinel, um, uh, which is a, a way to perceive uh, diseases from the perspective of animals, I contrast it with uh, sacrifice, which is the, the, the culling of animals. Uh, and this is what I studied in, in Hong Kong. And for each of these techniques, I also raise a philosophical problem and show how it is uh, uh, solved uh, in the uh, in classical anthropological domain. So uh, for sentinels, the question is, is, is what is a true or a false alarm? Um, and, and this is raised by narratives about the origins uh, of the disease in uh, a, a in the time of continuity between humans and, and animals. So what has been studied under the domain of, of myth or mythology. Uh, for simulation, so all these uh, exercises made to anticipate the pandemic, uh, I contrast the, the possibility to imitate animals with the, the, the technique of scenario that describes a role to each uh, actor. And I studied that particularly in Singapore and showed how we traced the question of, of reality or realism. Uh, which was a classical question in uh, the anthropology of ritual. And finally, I'll come to uh, storage and stockpiling, which is the, um, the, the, the final chapter of my book. Um, and I contrast stockpiling as a way to order the conservation of uh, virus strains uh, for uh, a, a pandemic uh, designed, uh, defined by um, an order of priority in the public's um, reach by these, these goods, and storage, with, which is a form of accumulation of viruses um, in the idea that the event will give different meanings to uh, all the strains that are conserved. Uh, so for example, um, when a, a new virus emerges, um, it, uh, the, the, its, prior, its uh, prior form can be found uh, in the viruses that, that are stored. Um, and so uh, relying on Alain Testa, who is an, an anthropologist, of uh, hunter-gatherer societies, uh, I, I define storage as, as a form of accumulation that doesn't rely on property, um, but that uh, anticipates uh, um, and, and, and prepare for uh, future disasters uh, by storing a little more than the quantity usually needed. Um, and, and so this, this, this accumulation, which is not ruled by property, is what I want to describe as, as storage. So I now turn uh, to um, uh, an ethnographic research I've done in, in Taiwan, because uh, uh, Taiwan was uh, very transparent uh, in communicating about uh, its uh, uh, storing policy and also stockpiling policy, uh, probably because it had uh, a strong pharmaceutical industry, but also a strong uh, democratic system. And Taiwan, uh, very much like Hong Kong and, 
and Singapore was very concerned by um, uh, avian influenza viruses that emerged from China and that could emerge uh, that to these uh, territories considered as, as sentinel posts, that is, as, as territories where uh, uh, viruses coming from China uh, can be detected before they spread to the rest of the world. And um, so I, 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 I did some um, uh, research in this um, uh, Institute of uh, uh, Animal Health, um, which is uh, built in a, um, a, a fort uh, uh, on, the east, on the northern coast of, of Taiwan, northern coast of Taiwan, uh, um, uh, which was really a, a colonial uh, site. Um, and uh, where um, uh, the Dutch uh, and um, the, um, the British officers were used to, to uh, tr monitor uh, trade um, um, between China and, and Taiwan, um, and, and which is now a place where uh, uh, samples are uh, stored, uh, but also vaccines are stockpiled. Uh, so this is the only um, ethnographic uh, fieldwork I've done on stockpiling. It's, it's actually very difficult to find information uh, uh, in, in, in the media or to ask questions to uh, virologists about these, uh, these stockpilings. And, and uh, I, was, I was lucky that I could uh, find this information on site, uh, thanks to, to um, uh, a colleague who is a, a vet in, in Taiwan. So in this uh, uh, um, fort, in this institute, um, they, 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 there were um, 200 um, uh, uh, influenza viral strains conserved in each of these fridges. Um, and um, uh, on the whole, there were 50,000 samples that had been collected from wild birds in uh, 2013 uh, by uh, the Wild Bird Federation of Taiwan, uh, which is a very strong uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, movement. Um, I studied its history um, and, and work uh, with them on their, their form of collective uh, movement. Um, and um, and uh, in, in 2013, when I did this field work, it was the first time um, that uh, uh, an influenza viruses, an avian influenza virus was found in, in humans. So there was a strong mobilization to see if this um, uh, uh, virus was also found uh, in uh, the, 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 the samples that had been uh, stored. And actually, uh, 3,000 um, of these uh, 50,000 samples contained flu viruses. Um, so it showed that the virus was uh, circulating. And of course, it uh, showed that uh, Taiwan was vulnerable to its uh, relation with, with China. And um, the, uh, an H5, H7N9 virus had been found uh, on a woman uh, and uh, uh, two samples from birds containing the same viruses were found in the, in the freezers of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, in institute. And uh, a, a bit later in, in November, um, a, a woman was infected by an H6N1 uh, uh, virus and, and it took six months to sequence the virus and find some of his genes on, on viruses collected from chickens in 2002. And, and, uh, viruses from uh, poultry are, are a sensitive question in, in Taiwan because of a, a strong poultry industry. So uh, in wild birds and in domestic poultry, there is the possibility to uh, detect um, uh, uh, the, the, the origins of, of a virus uh, um, and, and see that it was already circulating uh, and, and trace its mutations. Um, uh, this uh, fort was also a, a site of strong uh, conservation of vaccines for poultry um, because uh, um, Taiwan had a very original uh, politics uh, of uh, uh, stockpiling vaccines for poultry. Um, they, they didn't want to use uh, vaccines because it marked uh, poultry as positive so, it, uh, so they couldn't be exported uh, and it was more difficult to follow uh, to, to, to monitor the, 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 the disease, but if there was an outbreak, they would use uh, the, um, uh, the vaccines in order to avoid uh, the culling, the massive culling of, of chickens. Um, and so um, this politics of um, stockpiling vaccines for poultry uh, was considered by experts as, as a strong um, um, way to uh, avoid uh, uh, evolutionary bottlenecks as, as what happened in China and Vietnam where the massive vaccination of poultry uh, uh, had led some strains such as A5N1 uh, 
uh, to, to circulate uh, uh, after uh, av avoiding the, the vaccines. Uh, so in 2013, there were 10 million doses for H5, 4 poultry, and 5 million for H7. And there was a, a big debate at the Taiwanese uh, parliament about how to recycle this, these vaccines. So uh, non-use vaccines were incinerated and, and updated vaccines were bought after 18 months. Um, and, and to avoid this uh, uh, strong cost of recycling, uh, public contracts with private companies had been passed. Uh, to produce vaccines within a week in case of an outbreak, uh, what the Taiwanese government called an ad advanced purchase uh, agreement. Um, and uh, vaccines for uh, poultry were also um, uh, involved in the politics of, of uh, exchange uh, to the rest of the world. Um, so, uh, uh, of course, not with China uh, because of the um, non-recognition between the two countries, but to political allies of, of Taiwan, such as Vietnam, who benefited, benefited from uh, these, these vaccines. Um, and, and so there's, there's, there's a question of viral sovereignty for Taiwan to be able to produce its own, its own vaccines. Now, if we consider stockpiling for humans, uh, we may note that uh, so there were no um, uh, vaccines uh, stockpiled for uh, uh, influenza, for human influenza, but there were Tamiflu, uh, 2 million doses, 10% of the population uh, stockpiled after 2005, uh, when uh, Taiwan became very mobilized uh, on, on the flu. And in, in June 2020, uh, Taiwan, uh, which had been preserved um, uh, from the the, the, the human casualties of the pandemic by uh, a strong border politics um, was uh, uh, very strong in, in, in producing and storing masks. And, and this uh, um, politics of uh, producing and storing masks was considered as a model to build up stockpiles of strategic uh, goods. Uh, now, there were, there were no um, human vaccines uh, for uh, COVID-19, for SARS-CoV-2, um, uh, until uh, March 2021, when the first doses of AstraZeneca uh, arrived uh, um, out of 10 million uh, uh, boats. Um, and, uh, and, and Taiwan is, is planning to make its own vaccines in June 2021. Uh, but uh, uh, the German company BioNTech was criticized for pulling out a deal of 5 million doses of Moderna after uh, pressure from China, because uh, BioNTech is, is, is working uh, with China to develop uh, RNA viruses in, in China. Um, so it, you see that uh, uh, stockpiling uh, is not only a question of vaccines for humans, but also for poultry, and, and, and reminds humans of their dependence on, on on, on, on chickens. Uh, and in, on this uh, slide, I should have said that uh, for influenza, um, vaccines are made on, on chicken embryos. Um, this is a picture that I brought from Carlo Caduff. Um, and um, uh, whereas for, uh, of course, uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, vaccines are made um, uh, with uh, different techniques. Um, uh, this brings me to uh, my conclusion uh, on the difference between storage and stockpiling, which, uh, following my hypothesis on cryopolitics, I trace to the difference between what Levis Force called the, the cold societies and the hot societies, uh, uh, and because um, this difference of temperature uh, storing requires minus 80 degrees, uh, so that the, 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 the viral information is, is preserved, whereas stockpiling vaccines requires four degrees. Um, because the adjuvants um, uh, uh, can be preserved at this temperature. Uh, and this, this difference entails a, a, a difference in, in techniques of governance. Viruses are, are stored in freezers and sequenced in data banks, whereas vaccines are attenuated viruses with adjuvants that boost the immune response. And so vaccines are more oriented toward a specific event, whereas viruses are a kind of accumulation um, of, of uh, information to simulate uh, uh, the event and to retrospectively understand the scenarios uh, that could be built from this uh, event. And the, the final point of this slide is that stockpiling creates value by projecting scarcity in the future, uh, by creating orders of priority, imagining uh, possibilities uh, of, of, of lack, 
um, in, in, in a population, um, lack of resource, uh, whereas storage transforms the scarcity of material into an abundance of information. Uh, and this is, this is something that um, um, has been observed in, in hunter-gatherer societies, how they uh, accumulate things without uh, a sense of property, without uh, a sense of, of, um, of scarcity or, or of lack, uh, but uh, by distributing and, and sharing the information uh, in, 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 in the group. And, and so this difference um, of value between um, 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 uh, the, 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 the property um, and, and the sovereignty of stockpiling, and on the other side, the, the, sh the sharing and transparency of, of storage um, makes a, a big difference in techniques of government out of a small difference in temperature. Thank you for attention. Frederick, thank you very, very much indeed for a, um, a predictably uh, stimulating uh, presentation. Now, as I, I, met, I mentioned at the beginning, we're asking people to post their questions or comments on the, um, on the Q&A. And um, uh, in order to give you a few minutes uh, to, to do that, I'd like to begin, uh, Frederick, just by opening up the conversation uh, as having uh, the uh, privilege of the chair. Um, I want to pursue a little bit your your um, your endpoint about future projections and its relationship to global uh, biopower. I mean, as many have noted, COVID nineteen has, um, and lots of people have said this, revealed the fault lines of societies worldwide. I think that uh, uh, Secretary General Guterres uh, said that uh, compared it to the um, fractures in a fragile skeleton of uh, the social systems that we've built. And uh, since you're both an anthropologist and, and a philosopher, I'm wondering what kinds of fractures uh, do you think COVID has exposed and exploited? And what do you think the Chinese may be attuned to that other countries possibly are less aware of or concerned about? How, uh, for example, um, might solving the cold chain challenge impact global political stability or instability, or maybe to put it another way, what does solving the cold chain problem mean in terms of political power, biopower, and global uh, governance? Uh, I'm sure you've reflected a lot on these, but um, I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit about what you think is going on here. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, all the scenarios of pandemic preparedness uh, have uh, depicted China as um, the, 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 the the epicenter where um, pandemics start uh, uh, and, and uh, borrowing from um, uh, images and cliche about uh, uh, China as the sick man of Asia uh, from the 19th century. Uh, and this orientalizing trope is, is reversed by the way uh, China Chinese government has, has managed this, this pandemic after being criticized during the, the SARS crisis. And, and so the question of, of, of modernity of China is really uh, at the center of, of this uh, public health crisis uh, because uh, the, uh, the origins of, of the pandemics are, are often attributed to, to a lack uh, of, of modernity in these wet markets considered as uh, archaic. Whereas if, if we see uh, that the cold chain is at the center of the management of, of this um, pandemic, either in, in techniques of, of storage or in the production of, of vaccines, uh, we see that, that, that China has actually uh, taken very seriously the, the challenges of, of the cold chain. Now, what is interesting is to see that um, um, the Chinese population uh, uh, has its own understanding of, of the cold chain, and that's all the debate about the, the freshness of, of wet markets, which is a, a topic that I, that I currently study much more attentively to than, than, uh, than vaccines. Um, but but so if if the question is is how China enters modernity and 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 traces a kind of of postmodern future where precisely relations between humans and animals are um, cast in a different uh, way, I think that this this small question of how viral information is is stored uh, is stored and 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 transformed into vaccines for the specific. Uh, um, uh, purpose of, of vaccination, of mitigating pandemic. 
this is this is a very central question, and that that was the that was the goal of my of my talk. Thank you very much, Frederick. Um, we'll we'll turn to the Q and A now, and um, I um I I. I have one question from our UCL panel that I'll pose, and then I promise we'll get immediately to the um, to those that have been posted. Uh, this is from Jo uh, Cook, um, and she asks, could you expand a little on the ways in which vaccine sharing refusal, sharing slash refusal, has played out in the relationship between China and Taiwan, given the tensions between the two over the same period? Um. Yeah, I, 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 so so uh, vaccine refusal was very um, a strong debate between uh, Indonesia and WHO at the time of avian influenza, uh, because um, the, the 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 potentially pandemic strains of avian influenza were in Indonesia, uh, and 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 Taiwan was just starting to be part of of that debate on vaccine sharing, uh, and they they they. They played that game particularly for for poultry vaccines, not for human vaccines. Uh, but now that they've handled the the pandemic uh, um, uh, so, um, so so strongly uh, since the the very beginning, uh, uh, vaccine production is a, is a tool of retaliation from from China to 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 Taiwan, and uh, particularly as Taiwan is not a member of the World Health Organization, um, uh, uh, all the uh, all, all the means for Taiwan, Taiwan to require uh, uh, vaccines uh, don't go through uh, the, um, uh, the WHO. Uh, uh, it seems that uh, um, Taiwan has been um, um, uh, granted access to the COVAX um, uh, WHO initiative. Um, so Taiwan has a position as, as, a, as Taipei, and that's maybe the, 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 the way they do it. But it seems that a, a lot of this um, uh, politics of, of pressure uh, is, uh, is is very um, uh, in, invisible um, and, um, and 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 involves a lot of, of uh, companies such as BioNTech uh, and and is is not direct pressure uh, of uh, the Chinese government on the Taiwanese uh, uh, government. Um, yeah, Frederick, we um we have lots of uh, very good questions here. So I'm going to read them a bit slowly because some of them are quite long and uh, there may be uh, more than one question in, in them. But uh, the first one, which now has a number of votes is from Aaron Parkhurst, who says, uh, fascinating concept. Uh, the cryogenics have uh, physical properties, but also materiality. That is, they solicit social relations and define the terms of engagement between people and even nation states. I wonder if you might comment further on new relations emerging now from some of these dynamics. I think specifically of the UK's recent quote unquote relief initiatives for India, but also in light of government's recent leaked statements on the UK's vaccine success as a, as a success of quote unquote greed. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's very interesting. Um, so images of, um, uh, uh, eating and, and 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 physical satisfaction are applied to politics of vaccines. Yeah, I, I see the the, the point. Um, well, precisely, I, I started working on vaccines because I wanted to move beyond the the, the psychological debates on vaccines. That I I, I did some uh, investigation on H one N one, and the debate was really focused on. Uh, um, Ego, ego, um, selfish versus altruistic uh, acceptability uh, of, of vaccines. And I wanted to, to move further to the materiality of vaccines and now uh, how they, they relate us to um, uh, the, the, the production of, uh, uh, and of, of, of viruses. And when I did um, uh, uh, interviews on H1N1, people talked to me about the Chinese soup, that the, the, the vaccine was uh, use use some uh, squirrels, uh, uh, and so people are really attentive to what is inside the, the, the vaccine. So now they talk about RNA, and they don't know how it will react to their uh, uh, immune system. So I guess yeah, uh, cryopolitics was a way to uh, really look at this um, 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 at, at the, the the common point between uh, 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 being cured and 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 eating uh, vaccines. And of course that that's, that's also the, the relations I make with biosecurity between uh, the, 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 wet, the the market 
and, and the laboratory uh, and the farm as, as places where viruses are circulating. Mm. Really interesting, really interesting. So our next, our next question comes from an anonymous attendee. It says, many thanks, uh, Frederick, for a great talk. It's very interesting to think about how issues of in inequity are linked to cold chain vaccine techniques. I wonder if you might comment further on how you think the recent mounting pressure, including today from the Biden administration and WTO to waive patents on vaccine development, how this might play further into these dynamics in and beyond China. Yeah, so from what I heard to today, um, it seems that uh, BioNTech is, is going to work with Chinese companies to develop uh, RNA vaccines. Uh, so um, uh, as uh, the, the US is, is apparently um, uh, um, um, uh, leveraging uh, uh, the, the, the patents so that a lot of countries would, would, would appropriate the techniques of RNA vaccine uh, to avoid China becoming a strong RNA vaccine provider. Um, so the, 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 as, as China is, is pretending to become a, a leader in uh, inactivated vaccines, uh, um, the US understand that uh, they, they need to control the production of vaccines in what was called the, th the third world. Um, so so, so uh, it seems that there is this kind of uh, uh, strategy uh, to avoid uh, China becoming uh, the, the main RNA vaccine provider for the third world. So there's a lot of um, a, a lot going on below, below the surface here that, um, that that we won't know the effects of for some time, I'm sure. Next question: Could you say more about how your use of the concept of sentinels, sentinel posts, in your presentation relates to or contrasts with recent anthropological work? on multi-species ethnography and the more than human Anthropocene. Uh, thank you. So um, my uh, 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 understanding of Sentinel comes from uh, the ethnographic discovery that uh, Hong Kong people conceive of themselves as Sentinels uh, of uh, viruses coming from China to the rest of the world uh, because their territory is so close uh, to uh, China and they can detect the viruses before they spread to the rest of the world in the same way as some uh, sentinel chickens are posted at the entrance of poultry farms uh, uh, where uh, that are not vaccinated uh, uh, because then it's possible to see the effects of the of viruses on their bodies whereas the, the, the vaccinated chickens uh, it's, it, it's not possible to see the, the entrance of the virus in, in the farms. Um, so there is this idea that um, um, uh, being so close to China makes um, Hong Kong citizens more vulnerable, but at the same time uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a position because of their history of, of um, uh, freedom uh, to, to, to send alarm to the rest of, of, of the world. Um, and, and so it, it, what I tried to do in the, in the, in the, in the end of the, of the book was how to shift from the, the Sentinel as this form of um, early warning signals to the production of vaccines uh, and antivirals uh, as, as, as transformation of these, of these signals to reduce immunity. And, and that relates to all the understanding of immunity as a form of memory of the body and, and some immune system being, uh, being, some immune cells being in a position to capture more information, which are called uh, uh, sentinel cells or dendritic cells. So, so there is a connection in my way between, the, between sentinel plus, which is this kind of colonial, post-colonial uh, definition of a territory uh, as a production of knowledge um, in kind of tropical medicine and the, the, this, this new production of information uh, in the world of vaccines. And, and to um, uh, relate that to uh, multi-species ethnography and, and Anthropocene, uh, I consider that uh, the exchange of signals between humans and animals uh, in the wake of a, of a pandemic um, uh, is, a, is, is, a, is a competence that uh, humans uh, borrow to um, uh, their, their past as hunters, uh, because uh, from many narratives of uh, zoonosis or emerging infectious diseases, we are now in a phase um, of a new kind of Neolithic revolution where the, the, the number of animals raised is so high uh, that um, we cannot predict the, the, 
the, the pathogens that will emerge from animals. So that's why we need to communicate with them again through these uh, early warning signals. Uh, and so this communication is not a, a kind of local, um, uh, local uh, um, uh, reciprocity between humans and animals. It's, it's really part of a global game of anticipating uh, uh, threat. So it's, it's, a, it's the world actually transformed by the by the Anthropocene. So thanks for this question. It's a super interesting uh, response. And of course, uh, thinking about the uh, the advantages, um, uh, the dendritic cell uh, um, idea that you uh, that you brought up there, uh, the, the advantages of being uh, of being close to the origins of a potential threat as it relates to information gathering. It's a very, very interesting uh, parallel, and I think we could spend a lot more time talking about that. But I must move on to a question from Alexis uh, Badola, which has received lots of interest. And the question is this, could you comment on the infrastructural cryopolitics of vaccines? For instance, many Latin American countries like Mexico and Chile were hesitant on purchasing large quantities of mRNA vaccines, not just because of the cost, but because the lack of infrastructure to store and transport them properly in ultra cold conditions. Yeah, precisely. That was the argument of China uh, to uh, uh, share its inactivated vaccines uh, with, with the rest of the world. Uh, that uh, the, the technique for uh, securing um, the uh, RNA vaccines were too costly uh, for um, less developed countries to, uh, to share the, 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 the vaccines. Um, but but so 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 it it would be interesting to relate that to all the debate about about markets, which is also ruled by by questions of the cold chain. Uh, to mm -hmm. what extent uh, the, the the Western countries have given a lesson to China on how to properly manage their their markets, and maybe uh, China is going to uh, pass alliances with uh, uh, um, other uh, southern countries. Uh, in, in regulating the traffic of, of, of wild animals uh, and, uh, and, and, and regulating the, the transportation of, of organic food in, in markets. So, so I think that the politics of the cold chain is actually um, something in which China plays, plays a kind of mediatory role precisely between the North and the South. Super interesting question and answer. Uh, we have another anonymous question. Um, uh, which asks, what are the top key advantages of storage of a large library of possible viruses? How much time is saved in terms of vaccines being developed in the new pandemic if you have a library of viruses? What are the practical advantages? Yeah, well, that's a question that I often ask to my informants, uh, the virologists of Hong Kong, because all the uh, articles were um, concluding by the fact that more surveillance were needed and we need more strains to, to better anticipate. So, so this question of the, of, the, of the abundance of information was, was critical for them in terms of, of being able to, to precisely anticipate this event of, of, the, of the pandemic. Um, but but um, at the same time, with the, uh, all the uh, softwares that are developed um, for in bioinformatics, um, it's, it's possible to, to produce a, a, a lot of information with, with not so many samples. Um, but if, if you relate uh, uh, an emerging virus to uh, viruses that, are, that, are, that have been traced in the past uh, with, with uh, phylogenic uh, um, evolutionary trees, um, then you can say we could have uh, avoided a, a pandemic. And so we need um, to be prepared for the next one and we need to, to have more, more samples. Um, so so it's, it's, a, um, the, 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 it, it's a way to increase the library so to, to, to increase the, 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 the bank um, uh, and also to, to share the information with, with other, other labs that have the possibility to, um, to detect a, 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 a pandemic strain in another country. Thank you, Frederick. Now, we only have time for one more question before I hand, uh, hand the, uh, the chair over to Joe to talk about um, uh, next, uh, next week, week's talk. And I do apologize. We have a lot of questions here. Some have been up here for a long time, but it's my obligation just to take them as they're voted for. So the, 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 the last one with uh, several people interested is from Ethan Booth. And the question is this, do you think that the shift towards preparedness based on hindsight and away from risk calculations as a basis of preparedness will carry over to other crisis states other than pandemics, such as climate change, economic crisis, or even meteor threat. 
Or was this shift facilitated because of how sudden the pandemic spread and the repercussions came to be? Well, I guess that for climate change, this what, what I call storage is what is done with um, the, the ice carrots uh, that uh, allow to build models of, of climate change. Uh, whereas, whereas stockpiling is, is, is more um, a technique to, uh, uh, to, to accumulate precisely kind of freezers in one's house or uh, air climatizers, um, air conditioning, sorry. Uh, um, and, and so um, I think that, that uh, blind insight, if, if it is built at the level of information and, and sharing of information uh, um, is, is, is a better form of preparedness than only um, uh, uh, priority goods and and, uh, and 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 tools of of uh, uh, emergency uh, mitigation that will always raise uh, questions of of uh, equality and and so I, I also uh, answer to that very interesting question. I, I think storage is 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 a, is a is a better form of uh, preparedness than than stockpiling precisely because it, it, it it's more democratic and and, and transparent. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you very much indeed. This has uh, been a wonderful and thought-provoking presentation. And um, I would like everyone to please uh, a moment of silent meditation since we can't be together to applaud for Frederick, to thank him so much. And um, I'll, I'll take this, uh, th this, uh, this moment as an opportunity to uh, hand over the, uh, the chair to uh, Joe, uh, Joe Cook. Thanks again, Frederick. Take care. Thank you, David. Frederick, thank you for such a fantastic talk. That was amazing, really interesting. Um, so I'm just going to talk for two seconds just to say that uh, in answer to one of the questions, the recordings for all of the talks will be available on our website uh, at the end of the series. But also we're aware that there's not enough time for all of our questions in this forum. So on the website, there is a forum um, and I believe that Sara is going to be putting the link up in the chat or in the Q&A. So for anybody who would like to continue the conversation, that will be uh, live for a little bit longer. Uh, so next week, we're going to be joined by Jens Seberg, who is a Professor of Medical Anthropology and Global Health in the Department of Anthropology at Aarhus University. So Jens has previously worked as a social scientist in the WHO and as a health systems research advisor in the TB control program in India. And he's currently the lead on the anthropological component of the project How Democracies Cope with COVID-19. Um, Jens's talk will be called Imagining the Magic Vial, Vaccine Politics, Needs and Infrastructures in Denmark. And in this presentation, Jens is going to explore coronavirus vaccine projections and the imaginaries of vaccines. So using Denmark as a case, as an imagined vaccine community, Jen, um, Jens will present a comparative contrast between COVID-19 and tuberculosis uh, and discuss health-related political and infrastructural dimensions of the coronavirus imaginary in pandemic times. So I hope that you can join us. Um, I will now hand back to David to say a final thank yous, um, but thank you again for a fantastic talk today, uh, Frederick, and thank you to everybody who's uh, joined us and your amazing questions. Uh, over to you, David. Thanks, Joe. And uh, I know we're at, uh, we are at the end, of the end of our hour. So again, Frederick, just to say thank you so very much indeed. And uh, please, everyone, um, as Joe said, please, uh, if your questions weren't answered today, please don't be discouraged. Uh, come on back next week, and um, we'll try to we'll try to do our best. And under the constraints that we're all having to live with, uh, the advantage is at least we have a lot of people who can get together, um, if not uh, in the ways that we're normally more comfortable with. So, Frederick, thank you so much. Um, look forward to having you back again very soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.